we, we talk about how many, you know, episodes there were of the show and probably going through all that archival footage. What was that like kind of working with CBC, going through all that, restoring it and that whole process? We didn't have access to all 4,000 episodes because when the show was made, it wasn't in practice to save the episodes. It was like kind of run and done, right? There was no syndication. So there was no need for re repeats. There was no home video. So a lot of stuff, sadly, unless for some reason somebody wanted to keep it, was either erased and recorded over or just thrown away. Nobody's fault. It was just like, we didn't know better then. Thanks so much, Rob. I'm Daniel, by the way. Hey, Daniel. Nice to meet you. And nice to meet you, too. And I'm Shabazz. Hey, Shabazz. What a pleasure, you guys. Thanks. Taking the time to talk about this film. I appreciate it. Oh, Rob, oh. The, the pleasure is all ours. Absolutely. We are just so grateful for you sharing your time with us. How's your morning going? Of so course. Far? It's going well. You know, today is launch today. It's a fun, exciting day in any filmmaker's journey. But this one feels especially awesome because it's something I get to share with all of Canada who gets who gets the subject matter as much as I do. I don't have to convince anybody. As soon as I see Mr. Dress up, it's smiles, tears. We want to do hugs, that kind of thing. And then we want to put costumes on. It's great. Absolutely. We love that. Uh, you know, we absolutely adored uh, what you did with your film with with Mr. Dress up, the Magic Maple Leaf. Um, Thanks. And you, like, we think back, like, Canadian media raised us. So to have a film that really shows the importance of supporting that and having a figure like Mr. Dress up, um, that's really special to us. It meant the world to us. So watching that, like, we felt seen in that, you know? Oh, well, thank you. I mean, we wouldn't be who we are if it wasn't for the kids shows that that fed us, you know, the the way that the world works and dress up in particular. Man, so much of that engine is, is part of me and my internal workings, you know? You could go on and on. As you see in the, in the documentary film, we, we make a number of references and those aren't by accident and it's all by design because it's all part of the corner, the cornucopia of Canadian media for kids, at least what it was and, you know, what one day it could be again. You know, you, you got a lot of love that TIFF this year as well. And, you know, everyone kept talking about this documentary. How did, how did it kind of feel to kind of show off this to a Canadian audience? It's overwhelming. I mean, TIFF, you know, wasn't necessarily part of the plans. We thought we would get into another festival, but then we, the film was still being, you know, worked on and we missed the deadline. We're like, okay, well, you know, it'll be on Amazon Prime. And that's a huge victory of Mr. Dress Up documentary. But you always submit to TIFF just in case, right? Like, why not? And then it got in. And it was like, wow, this is not like a festival that I would say is like renowned for like a documentary presence. You know, big, big films come there. I think it's like the world's largest public festival. It's the biggest festival, in, you know, in my brain. <laughs> so to have a film play there and have like a world premiere at TIFF with people and, and a carpet that was actually like tickle trunk red. Yeah. It's just like more than more than I can fathom. Just I'm overwhelmed. I'm humbled by the acknowledgement and very grateful for everybody that, you know, worked on the film and helped make that that debut a reality. It was a beautiful it was a beautiful night and see the tickle trunk and just seeing everyone so excited and sharing their stories of what you know, Mr. Dress Up has meant to them over the years. It really was an, an incredible, incredible to celebrate. It was like the happiest day at TIFF. I yeah, a hundred percent. It was like the, the happiest day at TIFF. It's kind of like a, a reunion for our childhoods, right? Like we're all there as adults now, but it was like, I think all that, those inner childs that are still within us, some of us more than other, because I still play with toys. <laughs> we all just got to play again, right? We're just like, oh yes, this was what my youth was like. We got to hang on to it a little bit more. And I think everybody's so excited because we let go of that so quickly sometimes because we're racing to take care of bills or make sure this thing's done. But it's like, oh, no, we can still hang on to that a little bit. Definitely. Right. I think that's what people are, are responding to. At least that's what everybody keeps telling me. Yeah, for, no, for sure. And, you know, like, like you mentioned, like Mr. Dress Up has touched the lives of so many generations. Where did you even kind of begin to start piecing together what this what this was going to be? Well, it, it took some time to figure out what the story was. You know, is there a certain angle? What's the best way to tell it? Is it, is it a flashback? You know, at one point we were going to start with the Walk of Fame star and see how it came together. Uh, another entry point for me was like, you know, the show that's on for 29 years and 4,000 episodes, plus almost another 10 in like syndication and reruns on paper, it doesn't look like it should be successful, right? Like it's a, essentially a theatrical production because they don't stop tape. They film a half hour straight through the costume budget is paltry for a show called Mr. Dress Up. Mm. There's a puppet with a mouth that doesn't move. Another one that has a moving mouth, but doesn't speak. It's, you know, kind of like a middle-aged man hosting it. And yet, like, people rave over it. So, like, understanding why that works when everything on the page says it shouldn't was, like, a different entry point. And then it was just, like, 
let's just talk about love and passion and, and what the show ultimately distills down to and why we like it. And then it's like, okay, kindness, creativity, and costumes. It's like, okay, that is like kind of the, the North star of where things went. And then just looking at it chronolog- chronologically, oh, it's been a long morning, fellas. <laughs> looking at it <laughs> chronologically is just kind of, kind of made sense because let's just start at the beginning and take your time. And what better way to start telling a story than having our friends that we haven't seen forever and like kind of reunite with them and let them take us back in time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I loved having Casey Finnegan, you know, start things off. And I and I love how it almost felt a little um, like parallel to, you know, Mr. Dress of the show itself, where it was like a narrative around concepts, right? And, and I love that, like, there's so much of this doc that you're taking us through each year, but then we're really honing in on a certain moment or a certain, you know, issue that went on with the show. And then you, you, you know, tell the story and it kind of branches off through there. Was there ever anything in your own research that surprised you that you learned about Ernie or you just learned about the creation of the show that you're just like, wow, like I had no idea they had to go up this battle or go up this hill to tell the story. I'm, I'm forever fascinated with the production aspects of the show. Like all the music was played live off the floor. And that was one section we couldn't really get into the film. So it delights me that we can talk about it now. Yeah. Uh, you know, Hank Bonus, the guitar player, Don Himes, uh, Lois Pearson as well, the alternate piano player. Even the intro, the animated intro, was played live off the floor with every episode. Wow. Same with the outro. It wasn't they didn't just cut the tape. It was played to a monitor and all the music that you hear as Ernie or whoever's walking from the craft counter to the drawing board to the treehouse. It was just, you know, plucking the, the notes here and there. It was all live off the floor, like improvised. And that was really fascinating to me on top of learning that it was a nonstop production. It was just like, wow. And then how to write a show like that so it doesn't feel written. The writers, that the remarkable job that they did. And that's not easy when you don't really have staff writers. You have a few like series writers that are there for the duration of it. But you have a lot of freelancers coming in. And it just seems to me that it's a show that would be so easy to screw up like a spec script of Mr. Dressup because you'd want to do too much. Right. It's the show that needs to be really distilled down to the simplest concepts. And I say simple as something that's pure and just like potent, not something that's like disposable, right. but something that just gets at it. Mm-hmm. And so when you learn about how they did the show, you want to bring those elements in, into the film that we made. So every time it's like, well, how do we do this? And what's the approach for this? You try to bring it back into it. So like the anecdotes. Right. When people had a story about Ernie or whatever, it was like, okay, well, let's do pop up cutouts, almost like they did with the story time where things would move. It's like, let's do that. Okay. So that's back to the show. Well, let's draw some stuff on. And so basically, the source material kept dictating stuff. And the more we learned about it, the more it would inform what the film was. So it was a really symbiotic relationship. That's fantastic. And, and when you think of like what they had to do for those, you know, 4,000 episodes of, you know, just making sure every time they, they hit their timing, they hit their marks. Um, something for me, because you, you mentioned the music, um, I went to Ryerson or TMU now, um, and the fact that they have, in, in the studios upstairs, they have Mr. Dressup's piano up there, and every time like I'd go in there and that we were recording something or working on something, I'd just be like, oh my god, like I've heard so much coming from this piano and it just it's wild like it you you feel like oh my god like this this is a celebrity you know what i mean like you're in the presence i do this, every time uh, i'm in uh, toronto you know? and i'm anywhere near front street i have to see the treehouse it's a weird like catcher in the ride thing right like where i've got to have a copy of it <laughs> wherever i go like i have to see the treehouse there's just an intrinsic connection like seeing a family member if i'm in town you just yeah. you do what you, you you can so i completely get what you're saying it's magical we, we talk about how many you know episodes there were of the show and probably going through all that archival footage. What was that like kind of working with CBC, going through all that, restoring it and that whole process? It, you know, on the surface, it's daunting. We didn't have access to all 4,000 episodes because when the show was made, it wasn't in practice to save the episodes. It was like kind of run and done, right? There was no syndication. Mm-hmm. So there was no need for re- repeats. There was no home video. So a lot of stuff, sadly, unless for some reason somebody wanted to keep it, was either erased and recorded over or just thrown away. Nobody's fault. It was just like we didn't know better then. So I think we had a list of somewhere near like 1,200 episodes that we basically looked at in the archives. And we kind of were at the mercy of what the archive log would describe the show as. Sometimes it was, you know, they celebrate, you know, Caribbean culture and, you know, create 
costumes and crafts that to match other times it was like mr dress up dresses up there's like <laughs> <laughs> we don't know what's in that episode so let's pull the ones that we can decipher and we had to go into a bunch of those mr dress up dresses up ones to find stuff to fit like scenes so like bare naked ladies are in the film and they talk about bottle caps mm-hmm. well we didn't have a bottle cap reference so we had to start going through that stuff to try to find it and thankfully we were able to to land some of that stuff but honestly as daunting as it seems with so much archival material we had a team of researchers pulling stuff that was like just cbc and then other people that were pulling anything outside of cbc it was just like christmas morning guys just christmas morning lots of presents and gifts and it's like oh oh this confirms that this confirms that oh and here's that thing those people were talking about it's like even if we didn't use it there was like that journalistic integrity that was maintained because we did due diligence to figure that thing out (laughs) and then that gave us credence to talk about this thing and then do this and like that informed the questions that I did with interviews because I could talk about it confidently because I had seen the letter that he had wrote Fred Rogers two months before he passed away and what that meant and why that mattered. So it the research phase was awesome, but it was just like, you know, Indiana, Indiana Rob and, you know, the treasure of <laughs> dress up there, the tickle trunk cave or whatever you want, whatever. Tickle trunk cave sounds good. Those yeah. dress yeah, up analogy like you want to use, but it was just like so much fun to uncover these historical artifacts from all these places that we would never even thought to look because our research team was amazing. And then to see it there and like, okay, we can make a film from this. And it was just like putting the staff of raw and it just <laughs> letting the, the sun shine through. And I was like, come on, Finnegan, now we can do it. <laughs> I really hope they make, you know, all of those episodes eventually available for, for people to watch. Cause I think, well, what I, what I can mind. tell you, I can't confirm anything, but we are in discussions with bringing, a select group of episodes out it's a very difficult process as we discovered when it came to clearing the episodes definitely there is a lot of legal issues because of the way the contracts were built again in different eras different bargaining agreements it's a lot of work but there is an appetite to get some episodes out there so that people can remember the magic and introduce it to a whole new generation of kids that have never seen it and that can fall in love with playtime crafting, drawing, and dressing up. And you mentioned Bare Naked Ladies, and there's just a whole host of amazing people that are included in this documentary. I'm curious, what was the selection process behind that? Like, why were you like, okay, I want to make sure this person's in it and these people are in it? Oh, I wish it was that specific, but it was kind of like, let's figure out the most notable, you know, celebs that are out there, because you always want to try to have a celebrity in your film because it lends a sense of, you know, authoritative kind of ness to it that people see a celebrity then it's like oh there's an authority figure speaking about the thing i can (laughs) buy into it a bit more i don't necessarily always believe in it in this project in particular i thought maybe we don't need celebrities just because in canada it's so well known it's ubiquitous enough that we don't need kind of like a spokesperson on our behalf like we get dress up but you always put the best foot forward and hey it's not a bad thing if somebody says yes they want to participate right like it's kind of a good thing yeah And in this case, we just basically went out to everybody that we could think of on our list and everybody said yes. And it was like, okay. And if they don't appear in the film, it was kind of a scheduling conflict. It's like, oh, I can't make it because I'm tied up with this and you guys are filming here to here. It's like, cool. Hey, you know, no hard feelings. Thank you so much for agreeing to do with it. You know, cross hand, you know, shake hands and and kind of walk away. But there was no battle to get anybody that appeared in the film. I was like, yeah, I'll talk about Mr. Dress Up. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. That's incredible. There was a, you know, seeing a, another like staple of childhood for us, like, you know, Patty Sullivan, TVO kids uh, and seeing like Patty Patty's show up. Awesome. We're like, oh my, like Patty, Patty's so great. So cool. And just seeing like, seeing those people show up, you're like, yeah, like, of course. Cause like you, you always think of like that world growing up or like, like all of these people are like your, your, your heroes growing up so to hear them talking about and acknowledging one another it's, it's a very cool uh it's a very cool thing i love that patty's in it and fred penner too because now like you've seen them in these other roles on tv but now you get to hear them talk about kind of their process and their industry in a way that you haven't before so it's like seeing them in new light but fulfilling everything you would hope about these people because they're still knowledgeable and they're still kind and they're still that person that you know you connect with and it's just like yeah, this feels right. This, this is right on the mark. You know, and, and, you know, we've seen, you know, we've been really lucky this year for Canadians. We've seen a lot of Canadian stories get the limelight in this year, you know, with Blackberry, you know, taking the world by storm earlier this year, uh, 299 Queen Street West, which was uh, the Much Music Talk, which we love. Yeah, to shout out to Sean Menard, a, you know, a new recent friend of mine. His <laughs> love film it. got announced at South By and you heard about my documentary. 
he reached out to me right away and goes, you're doing a, do- a documentary on Mysterious Up. I'm like, dude, you did a documentary on much music? That's <laughs> Both are phenomenal. Both phenomenal. Both you phenomenal. Know? And, and, and that's the thing, you know, like Canadian stories, like, and they're not just Canadian stories, but they're being made by Canadians too. And like, yeah. we'd love to hear your perspective on, you know, the importance of preserving and celebrating Canadian icons. And it's no secret that Canada does not do a great job at celebrating its icons or its history. We're very kind of reserved and humble people. We're just kind of, yep, no, thanks very much. And we kind of walk off. We we don't necessarily light the fireworks off or try to blow apart a piece of the sky for any random reason, like our friends to the South. And I can say that as a, as a dual citizen with you know <laughs> some, some confidence. I've spent many years in the U.S. living there, and I love America. But Canada is not good at waving that flag the way that they are. And I think it's, you know, time that we have enough media history in particular that we start saying, hey, this thing is pretty cool. And sometimes the entry point to stuff like that is a little bit on the Kevin Smith side of things where it's like, look at this quirky Canadian culture. But hey, there's something here. And even if your entry point is a little bit of the oddball Canadian thing, like Look how weird you can't do this on television is and how that became double dare. It's like, oh, okay, there's an interesting you know, entry point there. Even if that's what gets people in, in the seats, I think you start to, to discover that there's this really unique culture of resourcefulness that creates things that are much more memorable than anything money can buy. The fires that you put out with money are nowhere near as exciting as the creations that manifest together. When you just work together as a team and kind of use what's in the kitchen sink or the, you know, the drawer down down at the end of the hallway. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, Rob, we want to be so cautious of your time as well and so grateful for your time. But I'm getting the flag that it's almost time to change costumes. So I've, <laughs> I've got like a minute left. We, it's just, okay. we just want to end off. We're just going to ask, you know, what are you kind of hoping that viewers kind of take away from watching Mr. Dress Up, the magic of make-believe? I just hope that they take that feeling that they had as a kid bring it with them every day and just remember their inner child and why it's important to be kind, why it's important to, you know, work with people, be considerate of people and, and to have fun. And that playtime is the best time of day. If everybody was that kid inside, that frightened kid that was worried about being picked on and use kindness, uh, you know, weaponized kindness as a way to bring people in and just knew that if I play, then all the world's problems will go away. That would be a better thing. And if this film helps push that in a little direction because it reminds them of the childhood, then hey, job done. Love that. Rob, we love that. We love what you do with this film. We really hope we get to talk to you again. And thank you so much again for your time, man. Please reach out whenever, guys. I love making pop culture documentaries, as you probably saw from some of my other work. I'd love to talk to you about anything ad nauseum, even if we want to pick this up and, you know, down the road when CBC airs it. Absolutely. Thank you so much, man. Take care. Cheers. Bye. Bye.